I want to begin by saying that there are two eternities. We've heard about one already. I'm going to be speaking about the other. And I want to start with a reading from the Bible. I love reading the Bible to people because when I'm reading the Bible, every word is worth hearing. <laughs> Not true when I'm preaching. Let me read a parable that Jesus taught, which I have never heard a preacher refer to. You may think you know this parable, but I don't think you do. Jesus said, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? Pretty obvious, isn't it? But Jesus was making a point. The first they answered, and Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. It's a very simple little parable. And I've had the feeling preparing tonight that I wanted to talk about one little word. One of the most important words in the whole Bible. It's only two letters. And it's the word do and a few related words like doing did and didn't because I believe there are two eternities one of which is good to hear about and the other which is horrifying and that what we do while we're living in this life decides which of those two eternities is ours and where we'll spend the rest of our everlasting time. There are two misunderstandings about Christianity that I want to deal with. One is by unbelievers and the other is by believers. And both are serious mistakes. Take the mistake that unbelievers make. They think that being a Christian is being a do-gooder and that it's all about being kind to grandmother and the cat. And many unbelievers will say, I can be as good a Christian as anybody who goes to church when they mean I can be as good. I was speaking in a factory canteen years ago and a man got up and said, I want to challenge you. He said, I'm not a Christian. I don't go to church. I never pray. I never read my Bible. But he said, if anybody is in trouble in this factory, they come to me for help. And all the people around him were nodding their heads and saying, yes, yes. He said, how do you explain that? I said, very simply, your grandfather went to church. Your grandfather read a Bible. Your grandfather prayed. And he was silent from then on. He didn't realize that you can only keep 
Christian fruit for two or three generations. If you lose the root, the fruit will gradually disappear. And his grandchildren would not be as helpful as he was. That's an unbeliever's mistake. That simply Christian is someone who is a do-gooder. And they will claim to be as much as a do-gooder as anybody in the, in the church. But the believer's mistake is the opposite. And I'm giving you the compliment of assuming that most of you are believers. And I want to deal with the second mistake. And that mistake is to think that a Christian is someone who does nothing. Who says Christ has done it all. And who believes that good works are no use. Because we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. And to many Christians that means that Christ has done all that is necessary and all I need to do is accept that. And as soon as I accept that, I'm safe. Didn't use the word saved there, I used the word safe because that's what they think it means. And I want to show you before we finish tonight that a believer can finish up in hell in the wrong eternity. And if you believe that you're safe, then you better go home now before I disturb you. So that's my theme for tonight. That Christians have to do many things if they're going to be saved eventually. I must confess I'm not saved yet. I'm looking forward to being saved, aren't you? No, you're not sure? Well, before I'm finished tonight, I hope you'll look forward to being saved. Because the word saved occurs in the New Testament in three tenses, past, present, and future. And it says of all believers that we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. And if I ask you, do you realize which of the three dimensions is most emphasized? The answer is the future salvation. And when Paul says in his letter to the Romans, we are nearer our salvation than when we first believe. And again, I've never heard that preach, that text. But we are nearer our salvation than when we first believed. Unfortunately, we have all fallen into the habit of only thinking of the past salvation. And we always use the word saved in the past tense. I was saved at a Billy Graham crusade. I was saved last Sunday. I was saved. I was saved. I rarely hear a Christian say, I will be saved. And on that future date, I'm going to shout as loud as I can, once saved, always saved, because then it will be true. I must explain myself a lot here. You're looking puzzled, some of you. <laughs> and I'm very conscious of what people look like when I'm speaking. So let's move to the Bible. And let's establish everything I've said so far from God's Word. And the Bible is full of do's and don'ts. Of things we should be doing and things we shouldn't be doing. Altogether in the Old Testament, there are over 600 do's and don'ts. Most of them came from Moses. And he told the Jews what they should be doing and what they shouldn't. 613 commandments he gave them. 
of which you may be familiar with ten. The ten big ones which have more don'ts than do's. More shalt not than shalt. But let's go back to the beginning. We were earlier reminded that Adam and Eve were our parents who began it all. And they were faced by God with one don't. Just one. The rest they could all do. They could eat of any tree. They had to look after the garden. That was their job. Adam was a gardener and God who made him sees that every gardener's work is done upon his knees. That's a little poem I learned when I was a little boy. Adam had only one don't. Don't eat of that tree. I remember when I was an RAF chaplain, a boy who joined the RAF came to me and he said, do you believe that story about Adam and Eve? I said, yes, I do. Say true. He said, well, that bit about being forbidden to eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I said, I'm going to put you in a library with thousands of books on every subject that you could be interested in. And I'll leave you alone in that library and you can spend your life studying anything you like. But you will notice up on a shelf one book that says not to be read by anyone under 25. I said, I'll leave you. Now, he was a 17-year-old boy. I said, I'll leave you in that library. There are more books than you can read in a lifetime. Which one are you going to go for first? He said, all right, I'll believe the story now. <laughs> Put up a notice, don't. And you know what the result is? Human nature wants to do it. Because we're all sons of Adam. And since he did what he did, shouldn't, we all want to. It's almost instinctive in us. I rem remember a notice at the college in Cambridge. A student put a notice outside his room. Don't make any noise, I'm studying. And of course, everybody stamped their way past his door and dropped things outside his door. Because it said, don't. Mother said to me, it's not my little boy's willpower that's the trouble. It's his want power. We all have that twisted will in us. And Adam was in a garden and he virtually said, not your will but mine be done. And the national anthem of all sinners is, I did it my way. Popular song made popular by at least two great singers. You know the song, do you? When I was in Berlin, I was there with Sir, Sir Cliff Richard, whom I baptized. He was a member of our congregation. And... Uh, he sang a song for the first time, and it was magnificent. It was called, I Did It His Way. And it took the tune and put just a little change in the words, and it was his testimony. I said, Cliff, you must sing that everywhere you go. But he was forbidden to sing it ever again. So you've never heard it. The reason was the tune was copy, copyright and so were the words. And he was told by the authorities, you can't sing that again. But in his life, he did it his way. Now then let's move on from Adam to Abraham. And Abraham was the man who did what he was told. God said, get out of this brick-built house with central heating. It was, by the way. They've excavated the houses of the Chaldees 
and they were comfortable two-story brick houses. I showed a photograph of one to my wife and I said, how would you like to live in that? She said, it's a little old-fashioned. I said, yes, it's 4,000 years old. And Abraham lived in a house like that and God said, I want you to leave that house and live in a tent for the rest of your life and go up into them their hills and it's cold in the winter. <laughs> and Abraham and as an elderly man gave up the house he lived in for a tent. And if he hadn't done so, you wouldn't be here today. And when I get to heaven, I want to thank him for giving up a comfortable retirement for me and for all who share his faith. He was a man who did. He had his faults. He was dishonest. He told lies to save his skin. But the big thing for which God blessed him was that he did what he, he was told. And that came out when God said, take your son Isaac and kill him and offer him as a sacrifice to me. And Abraham never questioned. He never argued. He said, son, come with me. We're going to make a sacrifice. Well, the son said, you've got wood. You've got the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And at some point, Abraham said, you're it. And he did that because God told him to. And God sent an angel who stopped him at the crucial moment. And then the angel said, I've got a message for you from God. God says, now I know that you fear me. God didn't know that before. There are some things God doesn't know. But he says in that simple way, now I know. God can say things like that. Makes you ask more questions, but there it is. Let's move on to Moses. Moses was the man who struggled with what God told him, but eventually did it. And he rescued his people from slavery from misery, from a life in which they had no money, no property, nothing, not even a name. And Moses rescued them, we say redeemed, that's what it means, rescued. And then Moses went on to say, now that you're rescued, now that you're redeemed, this is how you are to live. And that's when he gave 613 commandments of do's and don'ts. I read a most amusing book recently, written by a Jew called A.J. Jacobs. He's a journalist for the New York Times. He's Jewish, but not a practice, practicing Jew. And he decided to live by the Bible for one year and see what happened as a journalistic exercise, nice thought for a, a new article. And he wrote this book about what happened. It is hilarious. First thing, he had to give all his clothes away because they were mixed material. And he finished up wearing a white nightdress in New York. <laughs> Can you imagine it? And he describes how he looked up all the do's and don'ts, not only in the Old Testament, the Jewish scripture, but also in the New Testament, the Christian scripture. And he tried for 12 months to keep them all. He failed miserably, as was inevitable. And very interesting, as a Jew, he said, I found the New Testament do's and don'ts much more difficult than the Old Testament. That didn't surprise me. The Old Testament said don't commit adultery and the New Testament says don't even think about it. 
Old Testament says don't kill anybody. New Testament says don't even wish them dead. <laughs> Much harder. And whereas in the Old Testament there are 613 do's and don'ts, how many do you think there are in the New Covenant, in the New Testament? There are over 1,100, nearly twice as many do's and don'ts for Christians as there were for Jews. And those that say it doesn't matter, now you've accepted Christ, you've done everything you need to do, and he's done everything for you, and that's all. Then what happens to the 1,100 do's and don'ts in the New Testament? Well, you just happily ignore them. You've heard that I've written a book, Once Saved, Always Saved. You weren't told that I've got a big question mark at the end of that, because I don't believe it. I think that phrase, which is not in the Bible, has done more damage to Christians by leading them into a complacent safety. I'm saved, I'm okay, I'm heading for heaven. We're going to see that's a dangerous assumption. So Moses told them what to do and what not to do, and then he told them in no uncertain terms, God blesses obedience and he curses disobedience. There are many people today who cannot accept that God is a God who blesses people and a God who curses people. A God who pardons people and a God who punishes people. They just can't get around that. But those two sides of God run right through the Bible and you're not believing in the biblical God unless you believe in the God who blesses and curses. And when you read the curses of the Old Testament, you realize why God allowed the Holocaust to happen in Nazi Germany. There's a description of what happened to the Jews of Germany in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. And in Leviticus 27 too, when you read those chapters, you're reading an account of the Holocaust. You're reading that God said, if you disobey my laws, I withdraw my protection and expose you to the hatred of men. So God didn't think up the horrible things that happened to the Jewish people in Germany. He exposed them to it. He took his protecting hand away from them and that meant they could do what they liked and Hitler and his cohorts did. I've stood in the gas chamber of Auschwitz and Birkenau and Treblinka. I've walked on the ashes of Jews in Treblinka couldn't help it because they spread over the whole place. And I thought this is what comes to a people who disobey. It's described for you the terrors that will come by night to them which will keep them awake in fear. It's all there. And the blessing and cursing goes straight through to the New Testament. That's where we come in. And the do's and don'ts of the new covenant apply to us because God has not changed. He's the same God. And it would be totally unfair for God to punish unbelievers with adultery who've committed adultery and then say to believers, you're okay. You can commit adultery, but his blood covers it all. Do you follow me in that? That would make God the most unfair, unjust God there could ever be. But we'll come back to that in a moment. Let's turn to Christ now and look at his life and his death. 
How would you describe his life in a nutshell? Well, Simon Peter did. He was preaching in the book of Acts and he said, Jesus went about doing good. He was the best do-gooder of all. Everything he did was good for people. That was his life. Because he came to do the will of God. And everything he said was what God told him to say. Everything he did was something God told him he wanted done. That was his life. It was three short years, public life. But what a life that is. In three years he accomplished things that we, we couldn't accomplish in 70. He went about doing good. And if we are followers of Christ, if we're going to talk about following him, then that should be true of us also. He went about doing good. She went about doing good. But the real test of Jesus' obedience came when he faced death on the cross. And I say it reverently, but Jesus didn't want to be crucified. It was the biggest battle between his will and God's will, between the Son and the Father. So much of a battle was it that sweats, drops of sweat came out of his forehead mixed with blood. And any doctor will tell you that's the sign of extreme stress. And he was under such stress as he faced the cross. Now many others were crucified who faced it very bravely. They didn't sweat drops of blood at the thought. Why did he? It was a horrible death, a lingering death. The records tell us that it took a minimum of two days and a maximum of seven days for a man to die when he was nailed to a block of wood. But he was strung up there, stark naked. And people came and joked at a crucified victim. I've only ever seen one crucifix in which Jesus was portrayed stark naked. Every other one I've seen has a kind of discreet loin, loin cloth wrapped about him. But there is one crucifix life size in Barcelona, Gaudi's Cathedral of the Sacred Family, if ever you go there. Go and see it. It's above the west door. And a stark naked Jesus is hanging on a cross above you. It was a horrible, humiliating death. But that's not what, why he sweated drops of blood. He realized that for the first time in his life, his father would turn away from him. And that he would be made sin on our behalf. And he'd never known sin. He would be treated as the worst sinner in the world. And he never once deserved it. That's what he shrank from. And literally on the cross he went through hell. Hell is a dark place. So even the sun went out for three hours. Hell is a thirsty place. And during those three hours he said, I'm thirsty. And they cruelly gave him vinegar to drink which just increases your thirst. And hell is a godless place, which is why he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, Lamatha, Sabachthani, why, my God, why have you left me? Don't underestimate that cry. The human Jesus lost touch with his father. And that's the worst part of hell. But he'd fought the battle in the Garden of Gethsemane when even his disciples were so tired they fell asleep 
And everybody left him except the angels. Angels stayed with him, the good ones. But at the end of that battle, he said, God, if you can find another way, please find it for me. Any other way. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And this was the crucial crisis for our Lord Jesus Christ. And he came through it saying, your will be done. My gospel centers on the resurrection, actually, like all the Eastern Orthodox Christians. The cross is death. Resurrection is life. And if you notice, the preaching of the early disciples was focused on the resurrection. Yes, they mentioned the cross. Paul said, I determined to preach Christ and him crucified. That's a mistranslation. Take my word for it. The Greek says, I determined to know nothing but Christ and him having been crucified. In other words, the center of his preaching was the risen Christ who had been crucified, not the crucified Christ. Hope you've picked that up. The book of Revelation, John saw the lamb that looked as if it had been slain, but was standing at the right hand of God. I just throw that in. Let's keep the resurrection central and the cross, yes, led up to it. But the cross centers on the risen living Lord who has been crucified for you. Let's move on from there. I hear preachers talk about the finished work of Christ. It's a favorite phrase. It's not a biblical phrase again. Because in my Bible, the book of Acts begins with Luke saying the former treatise was about all that Jesus began to do. So the Jesus who began to do by going about doing good is still doing things for us. And if he wasn't, you'd have no one to plead for you in heaven. He's praying for you. He's still doing good. And therefore, as Christians, we are called to follow him. And far from the idea that Christians have nothing to do but accept that Jesus died for them, the New Testament, as I've said, has 1,100 things for us to do and not do. That's part of being a Christian. So let's just go through the Christian life in three phases. How do we begin? The answer is by doing. How do we continue the Christian life? By doing. How do we end the Christian life? Well, we'll come to that. Start with beginning. I've written a book entitled The Normal Christian Birth. And I've said in that book that even though Jesus has done all he needed to do and still is, there are four things that a man or woman needs to do in order to start the Christian life. And they are these. Number one, repent. And that's not something you think or something you feel is something you do. Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance, said John the Baptist. I was preaching in a theater in Aberdeen on the second night, a smart young lady came up to me afterwards and she said, Mr. Pawson, you frustrate me. And I said, how? She said, you've made me want to become a Christian. I said, well, that's what I came to Aberdeen for. And she said, no, you don't realize 
I've tried to be a Christian for years. I've gone forward at every mission. Every evangelist who came to Aberdeen, I've gone to listen to them. And she said, I've responded to the appeal every time. I've been counseled. But she said, nothing has changed. That's when you need a word of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. And he gave me one. I looked her in the eye and I said, who are you living with? And she said, a, a young man. And he said, she said, he loves me very much and I love him. I said, are you living as if you were married? Meaning, of course, you're having sex. And she said, yes. I said, why aren't you married? She said, he says it's just a bit of paper. As long as we love each other, we can live together. I said, so he's not made any promises to you? No. If he leaves you, he's not broken any promise? No. But he won't leave me. He loves me too much. I said, many people have counseled you before. None of them has helped you. I want to help you. I said, you've got a very difficult decision to make. I wish I could do it for you, but I can't. You've got to decide whether you want to go on living with this man or with Jesus. But you can't live with both. He doesn't join in in a, a threesome like that. And then she got really angry. She said, nobody else told me that. I said, and nobody else has been able to help you to be different. And at that she turned around and she ran out of the theater, sobbing her heart out. And I watched her go and my heart broke for her. I knew just how Jesus felt when a rich young man went away and missed his opportunity because he had a lot of money. And Jesus said, you decide to give that away and you will come and follow me. I was telling that girl, you haven't properly repented. Repentance is not feeling sorry for yourself or feeling sorry for those you've hurt. It's not even feeling sorry for what you've done to God, that you've broken his laws and spurned his love and turned away from him to serve yourself. It's not even that. A schoolboy once said it, it in the best way I know. Somebody said to the schoolboy, what's repentance? He said, being sorry enough to stop. That's a very good definition. And I'm afraid I sit through services where there's a general confession. And people say all sorts of wild things about from then on they'll be righteous. And I, I cringe with that general prayer confession. I want to shout out, have any of you thought of anything? Have any of you stopped anything? Are you turning away from anything? John the Baptist said, if you've got too many clothes, give some away. If you're bullying people, stop bullying them. These are fruits worthy of repentance. One of my favorite texts in the book of Acts is where Paul says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So I want to put your hand up if you could complete that verse. What did he do to be obedient to the heavenly vision? The answer is, so I preached repentance to the Gentiles and told them to prove their repentance by their deeds. I came to the point where as a Baptist pastor, I wouldn't baptize anybody until they could prove their repentance. 
And I remember one young man coming on a noisy motorbike up to my front door, brum, brum, and it stood at the door and I, I said, what is it, Paul? He said, uh, I want to talk. I said, all right, come on in. And he said, he had on a black leather jacket with brass studs and our settee has never recovered from them. The marks are still there though. We've given the settee away now. But the marks are still on it. I said, what do you want, Paul? He says, I want to be baptized. I said, do you know how we baptize people here? He said, yeah, you duck them in the water. So I said, Paul, you want to be ducked? Yeah. Well, I said, Paul, I want you to go home. I want you to say to Jesus, Jesus, is there anything in my life you don't like? I said, cut that out and come back. A few weeks later, brum, brum, and here he was on the doorstep again. I said, well, Paul, he said, there. I said, what do you mean, there? I've stopped biting my nails. <laughs> now listen, too many Christians are baptized without even that. For him that was real repentance. And I baptized him straight away and he never looked back. Number one, repent. Number two, believe. But what is believe? It's more than accepting something in your head. How many of you believe in me? Put your hand up if you do. Five, six. That's very disappointing. I thought this was a Christian meeting. You got to word the appeal right if you want a response. So I'll reword the appeal. How many of you believe that I exist? There you are, you see. Word the appeal right, you get a response. <laughs> Those of you put your hands up. How do I know that you believe in me? I was preaching in Hanover in Germany and I said the same thing and a well-dressed lady in the front row put her hand up. I said to her from the pulpit, I thought she looked as if I could have a bit of fun with her. And I said, you said you believed in me. I said, I don't know. You'd have to do something to show me you believed in me. If you told me to look after your money for you, I'd know you believed in me. And the whole place went frozen. And they told me afterwards that she was the richest lady in Hanover. Her husband had been a multimillionaire and died lifting all his property to her. And I have the feeling she built the modern church we, we were in. But I was trying to make the point to believe in Jesus is very different from believing that he lived, that he died, that he rose again. You can teach a parrot to say that. I knew a bunch of regard who sang hymns. Dear lady down in Wales in a home for the elderly. She was always singing hymns and the bunch of had picked it up. And as you walked past the cage you had, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> There's an awful lot of budgies in church every Sunday. <laughs> saying it. Well, the parable I read at the beginning, Jesus said, it's not what you say, but what you do that the Lord is interested in. You may even say negative things, but what you do is all important. That's my message for you tonight. So faith is something you do. And when the Apostle James wanted to teach faith, he said, I'll teach you about a good man and a bad woman, Abraham and Rahab. He was a good man on the whole. She was a bad woman, a prostitute. And they both acted on their faith. 
Abraham nearly sacrificed his son Isaac, and Rahab hid the Israeli spies and saved them from being killed because she said, God is with you. In both cases, their actions proved their faith to God as well as to themselves. And faith is what you do to show the Lord you trust him. It is action. And James says, faith without action is dead. It cannot save. If you don't act on your faith and trust the Lord in some way, well, I would want to question whether you have faith. But if you've run risks for the Lord and proved that he is there, that's faith. A believer is not someone who's accepted up here that Jesus lived and died and rose again for them. But it's someone who says, I believe in him and I'm trusting him. And that includes obeying him. Because if you really believe in someone, you will do what they tell you. That's what proves your faith. Obedience proves that you trust him. The third thing that you need to do to start the Christian life is to be baptized. And that involves finding someone who will baptize you, finding water deep enough for you to be buried, and submitting yourself to that person to be baptized. There was a young boy in the town in which I lived, Basingstoke, who had a body covered in tattoos. One tattoo he was embarrassed by. It was a picture of Satan on his body in indelible ink. Tattoo. And he went to our local hospital and asked the plastic surgeon, can you get that tattoo off my body? And the surgeon said, well, I can. Two ways. I can burn it off, and that leaves a very bad scar. Or I can graft some new skin from your thigh to your chest. Well, he said, I don't have the money all the time. So he went ahead and a friend of mine baptized him in a swimming pool. And he went down into the water bearing the mark of Satan on his body and he came up out of the water and Satan had gone. Have you ever ever known water to wash off a tattoo? But that was baptism water. And baptism is a bath and a burial. It's a goodbye to your old life. It's what the Jews were when they crossed the Red Sea away from Pharaoh. That's baptism. And the fourth thing you need to do, to do, to start the Christian way, is to receive the Holy Spirit. I'm quoting a command of Jesus. The word receive is in the imperative. He is telling the disciples, you receive. And people want the Holy Spirit to do it all. But I noticed that in Acts 2, they were all filled with the Spirit and they began to speak in other languages. You never know the power of the Spirit until you use it, until you receive what he wants to give you. And so people I know have prayed and said, Lord, I'll pray here sitting with my mouth wide open until you fill it with a new language. The Spirit doesn't do the speaking. You do the speaking. And when you're so full of the Spirit that you can't hold it in, you let it out with your voice and your mouth. So there are four steps to do before you start the Christian life. Repent, believe, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. And I've counseled so many Christians who only had three or two or even just one 
of the four things that you need to do. Move quickly on to continuing the Christian life. Jesus gave us a daily prayer. And he said, every day, go into your room, shut the door, and say, not think. Thinking prayers is quite difficult. Your mind wanders. Say your prayers. And among your petitions for yourself and for others is this one. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the Christian's concern. To do the will of God. And I, time is getting short, so I must rush on. There are two aspects to God's will for you. There's his general will for all his people. And you find that in the Bible. And there's his particular will for you, which is not for others. And that you find through the Holy Spirit's guidance. The things you find for all, the will of God is holiness for all. The will of God is sanctity for all. In relation to sex, the will of God is absolute uh, chastity outside marriage, absolute fidelity inside marriage. And that's his will for everybody. In the Bible we find his will for the use of your money. His will for how you marry, how you do your job. But his particular will, for some people will tell them which person to marry, where to live, and what job to do. Now I say to you lovingly, don't try and find his particular will if you're not trying to live his general will. Too many come to me and say, I've got a problem with guidance. I need to know who I'm, I've got to marry and what job I should have. God is more interested in how you marry and how you live and how you do your daily job. But in his gracious mercy, he tells you the rest. I got a, a book this last week by the post from a dear friend called Tom Hamblin. Maybe you've never heard of him. Brought up in the poorest home in Reading. The third or fourth son in the family. They were clothed by digging through rubbish that people fell throughout. They fed on beef dripping and bread. And that man heard the particular will of God. I want you to take my word to Muslims in the Arabian Gulf and the surrounding area. And he is now retired, but he spent the whole of his life taking Bibles into Arabia openly. And he was challenged, but they never were confiscated. And he was able to take thousands of copies of the Word of God into Arabia. Now, I've lived in Arabia and I know what the hostility is like to anything Christian. And he was such an ordinary, poor beginning in life. But he made up his mind, I want to do the will of God while I'm on earth. And that's what God's will for him was. Let's come now to the point. How will the Christian life end? The answer is with two appointments, which you can't put in your diary. The first appointment you have is with death. I can't put that appointment in my diary. I'd like to. I'm 
getting near it, I may be the first to get there before any of you. I have much sympathy with the previous testimony because I was told a couple of months back that I've got incurable cancer and that there's nothing they can do about that. And that puts a red light in front of my life. And yet I've never felt that I should change anything. I have peace that I can go on doing what I'm doing as long as I can do it. You're getting a lot of this kind of testimony today, aren't you? But I may be next to have the appointment. Because that first appointment is a different one for everybody. And none of us can put it in the diary. The second appointment, which follows that, the Bible says, first appointment is death and after that, judgment. And that's going to be on the same date for all of us. And God has it in his diary, but nobody else has. But we'll all be judged on the same day. Now, unbelievers will be judged. We know that. We, we preach that. And by the way, I think, to go back to the question about the relevance of this in evangelism, we stop preaching heaven and we stop preaching hell. But we know that unbelievers will be judged for things like this. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Paul's letter to the Corinthians tells you what will happen to many unbelievers. And there are other verses that tell us that. But I come to the point of my talk to you. There are believers who will finish up in hell. And I tremble to say that. Because I'm a believer and I believe in hell as a possibility, there's a fear in my heart that having preached to others, I might finish up there myself. Now what does Christ say about this? What can believers do that would mean they'd finish up in hell. The amazing thing is that most of the teaching of Jesus on this score is on what they don't do. And that what Christians don't do could finish up on the wrong side of judgment. There's a whole chapter in Matthew, chapter 25, in which Jesus was talking to his followers, not to the crowd, not to unbelievers, but to believing followers. And he said, first, you can run out of oil and not enough oil to keep your lamp burning until the end. And that's why I fear God at the age of 86. There can be temptations at the end. Those who don't keep up the oil, which is a reference to the Holy Spirit, surely. Christians who just can't keep it up and run out of oil before they should. The second story was about people who buried their talent instead of using it. God gave every one of us at least one gift to invest for him in other people and to use for his glory and the upbuilding of the church. And you can bury your gift. It's very significant. It was the man with only one talent who buried, buried it. man with ten used them to get another ten. 
The man was five years and to get another five. And Jesus solemnly said of the man who buried his talent and didn't use it for the Lord, that he would finish up in outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. And whenever Jesus used that phraseology, he's referring to the wrong eternity, to hell. And the third warning was in the parable of the sheep and the goats. And that warning was about neglecting to serve your fellow believers. For the sheep and the goats stand for people. And the sheep are the people who he calls my brethren. And whenever Jesus used the word brethren, he was always referring to his faithful followers. And therefore, not to meet the needs of your fellow believer is the third and last thing he says. Depart from me, you cursed, into the place prepared for the devil and all his angels. That's about a third of them, according to the book of Revelation. Jesus is quite specific. Talking to believers, he said, you could finish up with a place among the unbelievers. Now that's plain, simple language. That's why I began my talk by saying that believers can finish up in hell, not necessarily because they've done things they shouldn't have done, though the New Testament is full of those, but because they have not done the things they should have done. Sobering thought. So I finish where I began. There are two eternities. And you may be feeling, well, I was saved 20 years ago, so I'm sure of the right one. Don't be sure. If you read my book, One Saved, Always Saved, question mark. And I list there 80 passages in the New Testament that warn believers to be careful and not to lose what they found in Christ. Eighty passages. If I mention just one or two of them, Jesus said, Abide in me. If you stay in me, you'll bear fruit. If you don't stay in me, if you don't remain in me, there'll be no fruit your branch will wither and be thrown out to be burned. That's in John 15. Jesus is saying, you don't have eternal life. You have life in me. And if you go on believing in me, you will go on having eternal life. But branches don't have life in themselves. And we are all branches. He is the true vine. I'm not the true vine. I can have life drawn from the vine while I remain in contact with him. Lose contact with him and I've cut off from the source of eternal life. Oh, but doesn't John 3.16 say the opposite? No, it doesn't. John 3.16, rightly translated, says that whoever goes on believing in him will never perish, but will go on having eternal life. That's how we should translate the present continuous tense in the Greek. Very important. Even John 3.16 is telling us you have life in Christ. You are not the vine. He is, and you remain in contact with him, and you have, you go on having eternal life. Very important point. Well, I must finish. As Christians, what we do, and above all, what we don't do, is risking eternity. 
there are two places where everybody will spend everlasting life. One is with God and one is without him. One is with the angels of God, the other is with the angels of the devil. And Jesus was so horrified at the thought of anyone going to hell, or rather, as the Bible puts it, being thrown into hell. Because you, you throw rubbish away. And the Bible only talks about God's throwing people into hell, not sending them, throwing them. For hell is God's rubbish dump for people who have perished which doesn't mean that they've ceased to exist, but they've become useless for what God made them for. If you have a hot water bottle that's perished or a car tire that's perished, it's no use. You throw it away. That's what God does with people who have become utterly useless to him. He throws them into hell. Now, I think you've had a good balance in this gathering. You've had the talk about the eternal heaven and new earth, I always add. I'm not going to leave the Jehovah's Witnesses with a monopoly on the new earth. It's new heaven and a new earth. But there is a hell which is also being prepared. And God never intended any human being to finish up there. It's for the devil and his demons. But there is the possibility that anybody in this room could spend eternity with the demons and with the devil. And it's our job to save them from that. Not only tell them how to be saved in the past, but how to go on being saved and how to be saved in the future. It's an ongoing process of being saved. One day it will be complete. Thank God one day my salvation will be full. And on that day I shall look into Jesus' face and people will look into mine they won't be able to tell the difference for I shall be like him having seen him as he is. The Jesus who died for us who went to hell on the cross for us and who gave us the severest warnings about hell of any religious teacher is the Jesus who shed his blood that that might not happen to anyone. That's my Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for enabling me to deal with this serious subject. And you alone know what's gone through our hearts and minds and consciences. I pray that we may go away from this meeting determined to do your will on earth as it is done in heaven. And that one day we shall all look you in the face unashamed. I ask it in your name and for your sake. Amen.